Thank you. So I will just share the presentation. I prepared some slides, as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, it is a long deck, so if there is anything of your particular interest, I can talk about it in more detail. If I speak too fast, just please let me know if there is anything that you would like to ask right at the moment, just don't hesitate and ask, right? So as I was um, introduced, just for your clarification, uh, I was the director of Institute for Health Policy, which means I was responsible for all uh, data analytics budget of Slovak healthcare system, which is worth roughly 6 billion euros and large scale projects, right? So this is what my, my job was. My, uh, our task was to prepare the projects, to prepare reforms, and then it was up to politicians or up to ministers and state secretaries to try to implement some of it. And I would like to uh, just guide you through what happened and what's likely to happen in Slovakia. I started, well, when I started uh, at the Ministry of Health in Slovakia, it was seven years, six years ago. And since then, I've experienced six ministers of health. Unfortunately, in Slovakia, uh, lifespan of health minister is only 21 months on average, which means that every year I got well, a new minister. Uh, so I've, I've had I've seen six of them, and each of them introduced or wanted to introduce um, some more or less successful reforms. So in most cases, even though there was some continuity, uh, most of them came with their own ideas. So there's plenty of experience that I can, and plenty of projects that I can um, I can talk about. But basically, if you look into Slovakia, uh, we've uh, uh, since since new a millennium since to, to 2000 uh, we have had only one uh, let's say unified approach on how to do reforms project and uh, it was actually in at the very beginning in 2002 up until 2006 where we had a pro reform uh, a, a minister minister Zayats, who actually had a nice strategy a document it was called a blue book where in in which he actually in detail described what he thought were the key problems of the sectors and how he wants to solve them. So since 2000, uh, it was it took 15 years or 14 years actually, up until another minister came who had some idea actually what he wants to do. Because in most cases, unfortunately in our, in our uh, region, the healthcare reforms are very random and they are, they are more, um, they are lacking a strategic approach because in Slovakia we have uh, we have a long-term strategy in in healthcare. It was introduced by Minister Zvolenska in 2013. However, it it is um, a very broad strategy which has never been put in practice. So we have a strategy, but we don't obey to it. Up until 2016, 17, 18, when Minister Juka came and he uh, he introduced uh, or he wanted to introduce 26 projects. Uh, or reforms, and this is the bits of the, those are the bits I would like to talk more in detail. Uh, Minister Drucker was followed by Minister Kalowska, who resigned in 2019. In 2020, we had election and COVID, which means that in 2020, there is not a lot to talk about because most of the projects that were done were focused on COVID, and most of the reforms they would like to, current government wants to do is still in a phase of uh, unpublished material, so there is very little to discuss. I am also an advisor to the, the current Minister of Health, uh, who started his position just a couple of weeks ago after the previous one resigned because of very poor COVID, uh, COVID results. So just for you to have a small, small overview, right? So, but basically when it comes to Slovakia, we are not, let's say the best country to look up to, uh, because if you look into most of health outcomes or health measures, such as avoidable mortality here, we are one of the worst in the EU, we are the sixth worst, and this number has been const um, constantly, well, let's say maintained uh, uh, ever since they started to measure avoidable or preventable mortality. When it looks, when we look into the life expectancy and quality of life, uh, this is the latest data, which is which can compare across all uh, OECD countries. We are once again, unfortunately, sixth worst. And when we look into actually uh, the number of resources that comes into the health sector, uh, and we, we look into it as a uh, how many euros we spend per capita after adjusting for differences in in purchasing parity power, we are actually sixth worst or sixth lowest in the in the EU, which could actually explain why we are actually maintaining. The worst health outcomes and also we are one of the lowest spenders in in um, in the eu and other countries 
Um, just from a macro perspective, if you looked into our spending in more detail, you would find out that we are very inconsistent and we spend too much on pharmaceutical products where we spend 34% uh, uh, in comparison to the average of, well, uh, 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 roughly 21 or 22 percent in the countries. And when we look into, uh, let's say, more uh, comparable measures, like as, such as this one, and when we look into uh, how much we spend per different type of categories, such as pharmaceutical, outpatient, or inpatient care, we see that uh, we significantly underspend in outpatient, inpatient, and uh, in particular preventive care. And in fact, Slovakia is the lowest spender in all uh, EU countries when it comes to the preventive uh, measures. Therefore, it is not surprising that most of our hospitals are making debt and they have to be regularly settled. Uh, it usually is roughly five to six hundred million euros every three to four years. And these are the screenshots of, of newspapers from 2000, I think, 16 and 17, where the largest health insurance company, Slovakia, which is owned by the state, it has 64 person market share, was actually uh heavily in loss in 2016 and 17 and it had, it had to go in uh into a uh recovery uh to say phase and i was actually the head of the of the recovery of the health insurance company i was responsible for for actually uh, for the changes in order to make it um uh well balanced once again Right. So these were the some some let's say the macro overview of our healthcare sector. But as you can see, we are really lagging in health outcomes. Uh, we are one of the lowest spenders. We have rather strange structure of spending if you compare it to other countries, and uh, our hospitals and the largest health insurance companies also also making uh, losses. So this is not a very good starting point. And further on, if you look into more micro level uh, issues, or let's say the, the drivers of the problems that we mentioned. So we are one of the fastest aging country in the EU. Uh, the EU does a report on an annual basis with where it compares countries. And Slovakia is expected to be to have one of the worst impacts of the aging. And this graph shows uh, uh, the healthcare expenditure as a percent of the GDP from 2017, and uh, the gray one shows what is expected to increase by 2070. Even though 1.1 percent is not may, may not seem uh, out of GDP as a lot, even today when it's 2019 or well, 2020, 2020, 2021, it is making roughly 40 million euros extra every year of expenses only because of aging uh, without any specific uh, improvements in care or anything. So this is a, a big issue because we know that we need to redesign and change the way how our services is provided. We know that elderly people require very specific care, uh, more accessible care, and this is something that our system will have to reflect soon. When we actually looked into aging and how it's going to impact the number of patients, we had a nice uh, study done by Boston Consulting Group for us, and they suggested that we can expect uh, that the number of inpatient or inpatients, patients in a hospital, will grow roughly by 18% uh, by 2030, uh, which is roughly 1.3% per year. So this is a massive burden, which is likely to uh, happen in a couple of years, right? The second uh, big problem that we have and that prevents us from, let's say, uh, more daring reforms is that we have de uh, depleted resources, in particular human resources. This graph compares countries across uh, 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 European Union, and it shows what is the uh, average number of nurses and, and doctors. If you are in this quadrant, you have uh, in, in comparison to average high number of doctors and high number of nurses. And if you are in this quadrant, you have low number of doctors and nurses and Slovakia is unfortunately in this, this area. Uh, and when we looked once again uh, in, two, in 2017, we did a let's say a long-term prediction of how number of um, doctors and nurses are going to uh, is going to um, change in the future and we came to a very sad conclusion that by 2030 we are going to lack because this is uh, how many of vacancies we are going to have we are going to lack 10,000 nurses, which is roughly one third of all nurses available today which means that if we don't if we didn't do anything or we just looked into 
or we just uh, HR resources wouldn't be a priority. We would actually have significant problems in the future, in particular because this is a problem of all countries or most of countries in the in the Western Europe. And for example, Germany states that by 2025 uh, they expect to have a shortage of at least 30% of doctors, uh, which is impossible to cover with, uh, let's say, uh, expanded competencies of nurses, or, and this is actually a number which is very difficult to, to cover uh, by, uh, let's say, cheaper uh, doctors from Poland, Slovakia, and Czech Republic. So the problem is actually all across, uh, all across uh, EU. Uh, just for another illustration, the UK has a, uh, a they expect a shortage of roughly 100,000 of, of healthcare employees, which is actually um, exactly the number that uh, Slovakia employs altogether, right? So these numbers are absolutely horrid. Third issue uh, that is actually happening in Slovakia and all across EU uh, is actually that patients are getting empowered, uh, which is on one hand very positive that they are more willing to shift from uh, inpatient to outpatient care, but um, uh, in most cases, empowered patients are rather misinformed, which means that they have wrong information and which means they behave in unfavorable way and i'm pretty sure that it is the case also in you where we had a massive well people were burning uh electricity poles because they thought 5g antenna are bad for the health and we have actually uh, several online portals which are extremely popular they have hundreds of thousands of visits on daily basis uh which are actually spreading hoaxes and false information that so that's a big problem Four type of issue which we have is more of systematic problem. And even though that our system is based on a Bismarck model with social health insurance, um, we've introduced a reform which were, uh, let's say, pro uh, market oriented, which is absolutely fine. And the idea of our healthcare system is that we have health insurance companies which will selectively contract the best healthcare providers, um, insurance, insurance, which is us patients, will select only the best ones. And uh, the, the, the patients themselves, by their choice, will then uh, naturally give information to health insurance company as to who to select. So it is, it is very simple. The best ones and the most popular should, should, should survive. And the health insurance company uh, should be motivated to uh, uh, give contracts to those providers. In order this to work, we should we have a health system. Uh, what's the name of it? Uh, it is a, a healthcare surveillance authority which should do the supervision, which should which should check if the selective contracting is fair, and it has several roles. However, uh, in practice, um, this has this vision has never been achieved, and public and private entities are vertically integrated, which means that Ministry of Health owns. This, uh, the network of the largest hospitals. It also owns the largest health insurance company. Then we have a two private insurance company. One of them owns the largest private network of, of uh, in and outpatient providers, which means that that uh, that uh, that the, the, this system, which assumed a certain ownership and relationship, doesn't work. Also, healthcare surveillance authority is a very weak agency which eventually led that selective contracting uh, has been very limited and the contracting is mostly based on politics and personal, let's say, attitudes and interests. Uh, considering that um, uh, there is very limited number of doctors and nurses, uh, we have a shortages also in terms of number of in and outpatient providers, which means that competition is virtually non-existent. And generally speaking, our system, the way how it is established has not been working well because um, uh, the key pillars of the system are not, not working. Furthermore, considering that we have two private health insurance companies and there is not a legislation that would govern the way how they can deal with the funds, uh, they have been rather uh, profit-making um, which is on one hand uh, fine if you set up the rules. On the other hand, it can be misused as it was in Slovakia in past, where, for example, uh, one of the, the let's say the, the the largest private health insurance company paid more than 619 million uh, euros in dividends uh, since 2000, uh, 2010. 
So it is quite a lot considering that that, that yearly budget of that health insurance company is roughly 1 billion um, euro. So these systematic issues cause uh, the problems all along the way in a healthcare system. For example, this is once again the slide that we uh, prepared uh, together with Boston Consulting Group when we were trying to do one of the reforms. And we know that uh, since the system does not work, we have too many acute care beds with uh, below average occupancy. So our average occupancy in Slovakia is roughly 72%. And the, the average of, let's say, better Western European country is, is roughly 80%. Considering that health insurance companies do not uh, contract only the best providers, we have one of the most dense network of hospitals in the entire Europe, where 91% of population has access to hospital within 30 minute drive, uh, which if you look into other countries, uh, well, we are the second the most dense, uh, densely populated um, um, well, country in, in the Europe. However, as I mentioned, um, the, the, uh, the health outcomes are very poor. And what is most important is to say that um, we have more than 100, 130 entities which call themselves a hospital. We have roughly 80 hospitals, which, like, which are, let's say, general hospitals, which means they provide broad range of services. However, we would need only 45% of only 45 hospitals, not 80, not 130. And we, we, we could still ensure 90% accessibility as long as as uh, the network would be optimized, right? So all we would need to do is to say to one hospital, please expand your services to build a new one and to rearrange it so we could main maintain accessibility with nearly half of the hospitals, right? And as I said, the dense hospitals network doesn't work because you know we are sixth worst in avoid avoidable mortalities uh, and treatable mortalities. Some of the, 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 the diagnoses include uh, include ischemic heart disease um, and variety of, of, of diseases which could be treated if the network uh, would be functioning. The fifth point, which, uh, which is fairly same all across Europe, was inefficiency and corruption. Well, once again, this is, these are screenshots from 2015 and 14, um, where one of the former minister had to resign, she had to resign because of allegations of, of corruption. And the reason why that was the case was that the Ministry of Health did not participate in any, let's say, international benchmarking and didn't have sufficient set of rules and quality controls and check that would, let's say, uh, minimize inefficiencies, right? So most of these, most of these uh, problems that I just discussed significantly helped to form uh, the projects and the reforms that started in 2016 and to, and even up until today, they still significantly inform the decisions that the Ministry of Health is doing, and this is something that I would like to talk uh, about right now. Uh, but before that, just a couple of more slides um, that before uh, any any of the, the reform projects that the current or previous minister has been trying to do, uh, they've always looked into what is actually the future of the healthcare and how, what they want to achieve. But this is something that you probably know very well, so I just can skip through it. Uh, it it's basically all about that uh, patients and people will get more empowered and large robust old school systems such as NHS where I used to work when I started my career uh, uh, outdated and will soon uh, and will collapse in, in a minute. And as, as uh, I'm not sure if how it was in your case, but in Slovakia COVID uh, had one of very few one of very few positives of COVID was that uh, it proved that uh, uh, mobile monitoring, home care, personalized care, telemedicine can actually work, which is one of the, the biggest expectations we, which, we have, which we expect to happen in the future. And also we believe that uh, the R&D and personalized medicine will play a more prominent role. But these slides were just you know, side slides. They are not, nothing of, of particular importance. What I wanted to talk now is that uh, having briefly touched what were the key macro and micro problems in Slovakia is actually what we aimed to do with them and uh, how the, the reforms actually are going on, right? So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, for several years, Slovakia has not had a, a, let's say, a plan of reforms or capital investment projects. It changed in 2016 with one of the ministers who created 
a map like this. Uh, he created a let's say a scheme of 26 projects that he wanted to implement in order to let's say uh, to make system more stable. Uh, because when he was appointed, his minister uh, his name was Drucker. He was appointed as a crisis manager, right? So we didn't have his official role was of course a minister of health, but he was appointed as a crisis manager. So he looked into all different things that needs uh, it's uh, to be fixed. And he ended up with having 26 projects. Um, we, I, I drew this um, illustration, which just, which just illustrates how, even though the, the project range, uh, the project range is from um, public health up until uh, DRG and stratification of hospitals, these projects are extremely interlinked. And if you don't do one, uh, plenty other can fail and be unsuccessful. And this is something that is actually of, of, of one of the key conclude, conclusions is how interlink all the reforms are and without some, it is very difficult to do. Nonetheless, the very first project that uh, that started and was actually one of the few very successful was a project which was called Value for Money. It is a project which was done with the Ministry of Finance. These are the cover pages of the documents uh, that were prepared firstly in July 2016 and then updated in 2018 and 19 and 20. And the project was done uh, with a supervision of EU Commission and I think International Monetary Fund. The idea of the project was that we put together all data available from health insurance companies, from social insurance companies and from, from providers. And we spent half a year analyzing every single bit of it. And we came to conclusion that we know that these uh, certain segments of sectors are, let's say, underpaid or overpaid, or there is, there is a, a, a space for efficiency gain, right? Because the Ministry of Finance said, OK, you, we know that Slovakia is one of the lowest spenders in the EU when it comes to healthcare. But at the same time, we we think there is a great deal of inefficiencies. And if you fix the inefficiencies, we will give you the money. Right, and this was the list of uh, KPIs and goals in millions of euros of potential savings that we could achieve. And as I mentioned, um, uh, the spending on in our healthcare sector is roughly six billion euros. So from that perspective, it may not be much, but if you look into some of the the areas that we are supposed to save, it was quite challenging. For example, for example, um, we've we've compared uh, the prices of uh, medical devices in Slovakia, Czech Republic, and some other countries. And we came into conclusion that if the prices matched or were similar, we could save annually 35 million euros. And uh, if it then was expanded into some managed entry agreements and uh, value, uh, volume bonus systems, it could be even, even more. So this document, uh, this is just a summary table because the document had uh, roughly 120 pages, which and it explained everything in, into these pages. Actually, became it was approved by the government and it became a part of the official budgeting process of the country. So all these numbers actually uh, became a compulsory. So um, this. This second table is actually just the same. However, it shows how much of the savings we've achieved out of out of the goal, and it was roughly seventy five to eighty five percent of the target that we set. So we were fairly happy because when we started, we well, I was responsible for it, and I didn't expect this to be that uh, that successful. So just for an illustration of some of the, the savings that we achieved, these are the, uh, percentage decrease in unit prices of uh, different healthcare materials. These are the groups that EU commission uses in, in terms of how to categorize them and group them. For example, this category, uh, was the ICDs. Uh, so implantable, well, cardio devices, for example. So what we did, we've compared the prices and then we negotiated with uh, different providers to make sure that the prices go down and we saved the 35 million euros. What we then, then some of the some of the, the the value for money savings that we achieved were not achieved in the first year. Some of them took more years to implement. Uh, for example, this shows what is the percentage decrease in unit prices of uh, of uh, health technologies such as CT scanners of MRIs, because some projects were not as easy to price reference. In some cases, you needed to centrally procure them. You need to you need you needed to prepare a a, um, a methodology how to do it, or you uh, needed to make sure that the payments will be on time so the savings could actually happen. The point is that it works, but it saves time. And some oh sorry, there was a mis misspelling. 
and some of the measures to, took more time to, to push. And this is, for example, a decrease of savings that we achieved in, and it took two years to implement uh, in uh, diagnostics because some of the, some of the contracts were long-term, which means that providers just refused to negotiate. So it took time for them to persuade them to, uh, to for example, to say, if you decrease your payment or if you unit price by 15%, we will expand your contract by three years, for example. But the point is it's, it works, uh, but it, it, it takes a great deal of time. And as I mentioned, uh, some of the some of the the value for money projects require significant process and methodology changes. And this just summarizes, for example, the way how the Ministry of Health checks prices. Because up until 2016, Ministry of Health absolutely did not care what was the unit price of CT scanners, of MRI machines, of the hospital it it owns. It just approved that uh, the purchase is going to happen. It just approved that, yes, a purchase is going to have an impact on a balance sheet of the hospitals, but they didn't check the price, nor let's say efficiency of the machine. So the a pilot project started in 2016, which uh, made the process more bureaucratic, but checked the prices, checked the efficiency, and it up until today saved more than 90 million euros on, on on overpriced goods and services and what's actually more important everything is uh, done online and available to uh, public if they want similarly we started central procurement which is something that uh, was uh, piloted with ct scanners we did linux mris ultrasounds plenty of machines and this is just an illustration of of uh, 16 machines we bought just for you to see how efficient you can get if you centrally procure a 99 million euro was the uh, average list price of Varian and Electra. Um, and we ended up the same specifications after the procurement with the price of 35 million euros, which means that it works. All you need is just sufficient, you know, good team and time and political, you know, effort and interest in, in, in order to do it. So uh, the first value for money project was rather successful. That's why in 2018, they've introduced a refresh because as new reforms came, some segments changed. And what's most, most important, so the, the new value for money project, which we call value for money project two, uh, was finally approved in 2019. And it, it was slightly different to the first one because the first one focused primarily on efficiency gains. So where we can save money, because as I said, once we save money, Minister of Health, Minister of Finance, promised to increase the budget, right? And in fact, they did. Uh, they gave us a couple of uh, hundreds of million uh, euro more either to be spent on capital expenditure or just to increase budget in general. But in the new value for money project, in the value for money too, they looked into a more, let's say, um, um, allocative efficiency. So they looked more into whether it would be no, it would be better to spend more money on, uh, let's say, this very simple case, preventive care, because in short to medium or long run, it can save you more money, right? So we moved from a document which was focused on, let's say, quick wins to a more strategic document. And as a part of the document, further reforms were introduced. And one of the reforms was the way how the budgeting goes, right? So this just illustrates that it's still uh, comp the document still comprises of several, or let's say, savings that we should achieve. However, most of the savings were already part of the previous value for money, so it was more or less it was not as strict. The the, the biggest importance was that it introduced more, let's say. Uh, it, it finally introduced some reforms and the reforms which were which were meant to uh, make sure that our, the, our finances in the sector are sustainable. And one of the key reforms and one of the key outcomes of the document was that the way how the budgeting was done up until 2020, actually 19, was that the Minister of Health came to the Minister of Finance saying, okay, I expect that next year expenditure is going to be 7 billion euros. Uh, Ministry of Finance said, I've got only 4 billion euros. And they started negotiating like on a bazaar, right? So it was, it was not a very professional process. And this document changed it where it categorized every single expenditure into three, uh, well, what are these three groups? The first group was called no policy change, which means that we know that e even if there are no reforms in healthcare sector, even if nothing changes every year because of inflation, every year because of aging, every year because of some salary valorizations, uh, some expenses will increase. So we've uh, categorized this and uh, the, we 
In 2019, uh, this group amounted to roughly 230 million euros. So if even though if nothing changed, a budget in 2000, uh, well, 20 in this case, would be by 232 million greater than in 2019, right? We added to this, let's call it a policy changes. So another group of, of, of projects. And these projects were, uh, well, these expenses from this project came as a part of, let's say a change, which means that um, if there was a reform, a reform had a budget impact, we would add this up. So we would just split it. So we would know exactly what is an extra and what the, what the extra, what the value of extra is. For example, in this case, uh, it was a long-term care, uh, not a reform, there was just a small change in the way how some of the services were paid. There was a small reform in uh, this is legislation which is governing innovative medicine. So uh, we calculated that in 2020, 35 million extra will be paid for new drugs. Right, right. Um, we added these two numbers. So this is let's say a, an extra expense in comparison to previous years. But considering that we have value for money project, which has some savings, uh, we would deduct these savings from this number and we would add up to a whole a complete number, right? So we have, let's say budget for um, 2019 worth 5.2 billion euros. We added to that uh, a, a summary of uh, no policy changes, policy changes and value for money. And this would be the budget for 2020, right? So this is, for example, the way how we change uh, the budgeting. So it is analytical, it is based on programs. Um, it can be easily checked through KPIs uh, and it is sustainable. So this is, for example, one of the biggest changes and successful projects that we did. Um, the problem was, um, one of the problems that we've encountered during this project was that the value for money, uh, let's say goals, uh, as you, as you may recall, I, I mentioned that we achieved them on 75 to 85%, which means there will be some gap and there always is some gap. Uh, but the ideal Ministry of Finance is that they want to, let's say, stimulate health insurance companies and health insurance providers to be more efficient. Nonetheless, uh, this is the way how it start, how it works as of even today. No, no, uh, but um, uh, the first year was, uh, well, let's say not as successful as the following years. These are just the screenshots which are saying that uh, the budget for 2019 and 2020 is supposed to be the, the biggest ever, which was, however, true. No, unless not because of the way we intended it to be, but because of the, the calculations which I showed you here, uh, which we did in 2018-19 were not done correctly because it was done for the first time and we made several mistakes. So this uh, no policy was not supposed to be 231, but roughly 400 million policy change were not 160, but I think all 19 and the value for money was not 148, but I think 50 or 70. So overall it ended up uh, with, uh, with health insurance companies uh, making loss and us forcing, uh, and they forced us to increase finances at the end of the year. Nonetheless, um, this was a small problem with the reform, but we fixed the issues. We uh, made the numbers more, let's say, real, and the budgeting still continues even during the COVID because it is it is very flexible. And this is also the the, the way how EU Commission. Uh, let's say prefer countries to do the budget because it's it's uh, structural analytical and you can easily measure uh, the outcomes and outputs of of all your activities and through them you can control the providers yes so this was uh, the value for money project and let's say more uh, money based uh, let's say initiatives or the things that are happening in slovakia the value based uh, the value for money project was uh, announced by eu commission as one of the success cases and best practices in the not only in our region but all across uh, the eu because as a part of the work that we did we compared slovakia to other countries. So basically we did the value for money for other countries because for example, Czech Republic or Hungary could compare as well against us and they could easily spot that uh, if we had inefficiency worth 200 million, they had inefficiency worth, let's say 400 million euros. So uh, some of other countries are now trying to implement the project. But as a part of the, the uh, 26 uh, ideas, some of them took place and some of them, some of them are still actually currently being discussed. So first of the projects, first of the reforms I would like to talk about is we call it integrated care centers, which are outpatient providers, something like large polyclinics. 
So the, one of the problems of, uh, of, of our healthcare system, as I said, was that we do not have sufficient uh, doctors and nurses. Uh, if we looked into this uh, problem into more details, we would see that we have very few generalists and, very, uh, and too many specialists. And therefore, if we looked into what is the network, this is, this, these dots are, the green dots are uh, general practitioners and the red dots are general practitioners for children, right? We would see that Slovakia is um, is not equally covered, and not and, and Slovaks don't have equal access to to primary care services. And if we want them to be gatekeepers, if we want them to be the ones who make sure that we don't uh, spend unnecessary resources on specialists or inpatient care, we need to make sure that the network is is very accessible. We um, luckily for us, we got 140 million euros from EU structural funds to build or reconstruct existing capacities um, with the idea of, uh, or let's say, supporting the, um, the, the, uh, the, the providers, the surgeries, which have a potential to grow and the potential to attract other doctors and, and patients. And this is what, most, what the reform was about. Uh, we call it the integrated care center because we wanted to integrate different types of uh, generalist and specialist, social services, uh, mobile care units, everything under one roof. So a patient would have one-stop shop for the services he, he needed, right? Um, as a part of the preparation of this, of this uh, the project, we looked into, once again, uh, nice analytics into uh, each and every single area in Slovakia and and we look into how the patients are flowing. Um, and this, this illustrates, for example, that even though that in this southern part of Slovakia, we had several, uh, several, actually probably hundreds of providers, uh, there are some which are, let's say, um, focal, right? So the small ones tend to send patients to them and the patients prefer voluntarily to go to, that, um, to those points. And we've decided that these points will or could uh, be, let's say, expanded and financed from the structural funds, right? So we wanted uh, to replace some of the smaller points uh, from which the patients are flowing. We wanted, to, we wanted to make sure that once they reach the focal point, all services they need will be provided at sufficient quality and, and sufficient depth of service uh, there, right? Uh, so we looked into it as to how to make sure that the, the points are set so that uh, accessibility for Slovaks within 15, 15 minutes will be maintained. It was possible if we reconstructed or built roughly 90 points. Uh, so we didn't need that much. So we are talking about uh, outpatient providers and we have 10,000 of them. So it's not actually that much. And uh, the project uh, started, as I said, in 2016, the first uh, reconstruction of first, let's say, uh, funding was approved in 2018, and as of 2021, uh, these um, green and blue dots are the bots. Uh, sorry, the group, uh, the green dots are the uh, the bots which have already been approved as a for the funding, and uh, the blue ones are the ones which are uh, currently in the process of being uh, processed. The gray ones are the ones which are still not yet in the process of uh well asking for the funds because you know it's the project is going to take several years nonetheless even with these projects the the green and blue ones uh 70 percent of the population is covered within 20 minutes by an integrated care center which integrates the services for us so we believe that by the end of uh, next year because this year was well very uns not standard because nothing actually happened because everything was focused on, on COVID, we believe by the, the end of next year, uh, this percentage shall grow to at least 85 to 90, 90%, right? But once again, as I said, the key idea of this reform was to improve accessibility and to make sure that patient has integrated care so he doesn't have to travel all across different specialists. And if he has to, he know exactly why, where is a specialist and what he can expect as the outcome, right? This reform was linked to a inpatient provider reform. We called it stratification project, which unfortunately was not approved by the parliament uh, in 2019. And it was postponed up until 2020 when COVID came. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the project is still alive and it should be hopefully uh, approved by the government by the end of uh, well this year, at least to some extent. 
Well, but as I was mentioning at the beginning, when I was describing some issues in Slovakia, we know that uh, our network is very dense. Uh, the hospitalization rate in Slovakia, we have roughly 1 million hospitalizations per year, is 9% uh, higher than in Western Europe. Uh, we have 32,000 beds, and as I mentioned, roughly 139 providers which call themselves a, a hospital. Uh, as, as I said, we have 32,000 beds. Uh, I mentioned this before, but our occupancy is roughly 72%, which is below the average of the EU. And as I said, uh, it doesn't improve our health outcomes. We are one of the worst, and uh, we don't need as many of them because we would need only 45 hospitals. So if, when, once, when we looked into the, the hospital network, we, the network is, let's say, regulated by the Ministry of Health. Uh, as the Ministry of Health defines a, let's say, a legislative act that binds health insurance companies to, to contract a minimum network. It is called, very strangely, terminal network of providers, and it manually defines which hospitals needs to be uh, contracted by all three health insurance companies. For whatever reason, there are only 12 hospitals in Slovakia, and as you can see, it doesn't cover within uh, 30 minutes uh, great parts of Slovakia, which are the, the white areas, right? For uh, In order to change this, I think it was in 2014 and 15, uh, this net terminal network was expanded by a network of, uh, of, of emergency departments, which means that health insurance companies are obliged, they have to contract a uh, emergency departments in 38 hospitals, which is rather funny because, you know, let's say that you have to, you are a health insurance company and you have to contract an emergency department in this area of Slovakia, but you are not obliged, you don't have to contract the rest of the hospital. So it is, it is, it is obvious that the system didn't work well and um, the, the idea of, of the of the stratification reform was to change the way how this legislation works and to create a 42 points in Slovakia, which will have to be contracted. But what is, what's most important is that we not only defined uh, the hospitals which need to be contracted, we defined the levels of hospitals, which means that up until today, we don't have, let's say, a hierarchy of hospitals. We have uni universal hospital, we have teaching hospitals, we have some general hospitals, but we don't define as to what type of services they have to and they can provide, which, which, which means that we have some local small hospitals which are trying to do very expensive and, and complicated treatments. And then we have large scale hospitals University specialized uh, cardiovascular institutes, which are sometimes doing uh, serv providing services which are way above what they should be doing. So, as a part of the reform, we didn't look also uh, we didn't look only into the optimum network of providers where should where they should be, but also what kind of services they should provide it and uh, how to motivate them to provide those type of services right and as i said we've optimized the network uh, geographically we looked into the accessibility of uh, summer and winter areas because in slovakia the winters can get very bad and also what's important we not only defined the network uh, the level but we also defined that in certain areas you have to do at least certain uh, amount of treatments in order to get reimbursed for we call it evidence based hospital referrals saying for example that if you want to have an uh, uh, delivery department, oh, I'm not sure how it's called, obstetricians to have deliveries, you need to have at least, let's say, 650 deliveries per year, right? If you wanted to have certain type of lungs, uh, cancer surgeries, you would have to have certain number of, of treatments per year in order in order for you to be allowed to do it in the future, right? And th the problem was when we looked into these type of evidence-based hospital referrals, we looked into Cochrane databases, we looked into all different statistics, which linked outcome or the number of treatments done by hospital, by team, by doctor, and the outcome of it, we found out uh, that, uh, that uh, roughly 40% of hospitals are usually below the threshold. And this is just a summary the diagram of, of it, where the below threshold for lung cancer surgery is you know, all this uh, purple spot, right? So you can see that uh, plenty of hospitals are actually doing lung cancer surgery well below the, let's say, safety uh, number of, of, of treatments. And uh, when we looked into also the outcomes of the hospitals, usually the rate of 
and uh, the mortality or rehospitalization was much higher compared to the ones which were above threshold or just just on the line right another group of reforms that uh, were introduced in this was in 2019 was um, uh, were the reforms which were focused on how to st stabilize uh, personal as i mentioned before we are the countries which are, is in the, the bottom left quadrant of 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 a number of doctors and nurses however the situation was is even actually worse uh, because as i mentioned uh, when we uh, before when we did some let's say long term um, uh, extrapolations and estimation as to how many doctors and nurses are going going to have we are going to uh, lack roughly 10,000 nurses. Well, then uh, in 2019, we looked into actually what is the issue? How come we ended up um, that ended up with uh, which, such a such a massive gap of of personnel? Because in 2018, 19, when we were doing the study at that time, we were uh, we were missing, lacking roughly 3,000 do uh, doctors and roughly 3,000 nurses. Uh, if, we, if we calculate it into this number, how many of current nurses and doctors are already in uh, retirement age and yet they still work, but they don't have to, the numbers would be 5,500 doctors and 4,300 nurses, and which is quite a lot considering that we have roughly 30,000 nurses and 19,000 or 18,000 uh, doctors, right? So uh, um, when we looked into the reasons why this is the case, uh, and what is the reason why we have so you know few doctors and nurses? So the problem was that when it comes to uh, nurses, only four out of ten graduates actually end up working in Slovakia. And according to the service, the uh, service we did, the reason was the salary. Then they didn't feel valued. And uh, well, uh, the problem was that in most cases, when they were young, they left and they found a family abroad, so they stayed there. So they were lacking some, let's say, social security or some benefits. When it comes to the doctors, the, the reasons were slightly different because eight out of 10 doctors stayed in Slovakia. So the problem was that the capacity of education system was, was not enough. And then the, the other problems, the problems that, that we faced with them were uh, that, um, they wanted to do the state of the art medicines and the investment gap of Slovak hospitals was calculated by us and European Investment Bank to be roughly 6 billion euros, right? So hospitals are average age of a hospital building is 44 years, right? So you have a building, there is hospital, 44 years was is average life of, or, well, yes, age, age of, of, the, of the hospital. So, but what we did uh, in the short, short term, because this material was uh, presented uh, in 2019 to the, uh, uh, to the government, is there is a part of the government which is focused on, let's say, a safety concerns of the state. And we presented it as a state a safety concern of the state concern. If you don't have doctors and nurses, we can't treat our patients. So they, they gave us some budget. Uh, so we could, uh, let's say, increase uh, salaries of the nurses by roughly uh, 10 uh, percent. And uh, what it actually did, it shifted Slovakia from this black, uh, black bar uh, to this area roughly somewhere um, um, uh, next to Czech Republic. These are relative salaries, which is first problem, which means that you can have relatively similar salary in Slovakia as you have in Israel, but in Israel it's like three times more in absolute terms. And the second problem was because our biggest competitor when it comes to nurses is Czech Republic and, and Austria. Once uh, Czech Republic minister heard what we did, he increased uh, the salaries of nurses by 12%, which is the fact that you can't compete based solely on salaries because this is uh, this is what actually will eventually happen. Nonetheless, the number of nurses seemed fine by the time COVID came, COVID changed everything because most of the nurses had to work uh, all the year. We had a specific law which prevented them from leaving the job or taking holiday as long as they worked in a, in a hospital. And according to the Slovak Chamber of Nurses and Midwives, uh, they expect expect a, a massive decrease of roughly 1,000 nurses because of COVID and the exhaustion they feel, which means that uh, everything that we achieved based of thanks to the increases in the salaries and some other motivation mechanisms we introduced was uh, offset by 
by COVID. So as I said, uh, uh, we had elections in 2020 and COVID, which, or, which actually changed uh, a lot because it finally uh, showed to the public and to media how fragile our system is because up to today you know uh, you would you would see and feel the the fragility of our system only if you were patient and in most cases you were lucky that you got treated etc cetera, etc cetera. so even though we all knew the system is and ha is still having problems um it was still not a let's say a big let's say concern or priority Every time before an election, healthcare sector, healthcare problems were one of the biggest topics and issues. Once the party was elected, it just disappeared. Luckily, this changed, well, this not luckily, but this changed thanks to COVID. And COVID brought about uh, one amazing opportunity. Uh, uh, European Union uh, enabled countries to, let's say, uh, in order to bolster and strengthen their uh, economies and to recover at a fast rate from, from uh, COVID, they gave them some structural funds and uh, which actually translated into roughly 1.5 billion euros uh, we can spend from the structural funds up until 2026. Uh, this is, uh, this, these resources are resources which we don't have to return basically, so we can spend it wherever we want. The only condition of EU Commission was that you need to finish the reforms, right? So uh, COVID highlighted some other areas that I haven't mentioned. And even though in, in 2020, actually, well, nothing happened in Slovakia because, uh, because COVID stopped it. Um, and we had very bad uh, wave in autumn, winter, and well, January, February of, of this year, which actually caused that most of the workers of the ministry were focusing only on COVID. Nonetheless, um, uh, the, the ministry, let's say, looked into the 26th project that previous government did. They sh shook some up, uh, updated some, uh, some deleted, and they came up with their own list of reforms. And they split these reforms, which will be financed from the structural funds into the three groups. The first group they call modern and accessible healthcare services. And the first of the network is of the first of the reform is the hospital network optimization, which is the stratification I just I just uh, explained to you in more details. The only difference is uh, is between the the way it was prepared in 2019 or 18, 19, and this one is that um, they want to make it even more how to say more strict. So the, the hurdles and the KPIs will be more strict, which is very fine. The, the reform has not yet been uh, published, but it's uh, I've seen it, I've commented it, and it's actually virtually the very same project. Um, as a part of this, the government realized, uh, the COVID, COVID made them realize that they actually have very limited control over the hospitals and very limited control over the system. This is, um, to be honest, true, uh, because even though the ministry has control over the hospital, largest one, it, does still, it still does not have sufficient, let's say, analytical and, and implementation capacities for them to help them uh, reprofilize uh, or, or, or change. Therefore, some of the reforms are focusing on creating a network of private hospitals, because as of today, we have university and teaching hospitals operating as single entities. And as, a, as one of the reforms they want to do, they want to create a, a, a network uh, organization such as uh, Helios in Germany or Ribera Saud in Spain. So this is something they want to do. And once again, uh, considering that uh, they would like to uh, make they would like to make the, the network of hospitals more strict. We wanted 45. Uh, current idea is to do only 38 hospitals. They want to rather uh, bolster emergency services, right? So ambulance, ambulances, so the cars, car services. But basically, it is, uh, the, it is the same part of reforms. However, none of it is yet published, only the budget they would like to spend, which is roughly 1.1 billion euros. And if you are interested in more details, in which areas they would like to spend how much money. So basically they would like to spend 1 billion on reconstruction and reprofilization of hospitals. Because you know, if you, made, if you make uh, different categories of hospitals, uh, some of the hospitals will have to you know, buy some, buy some uh, equipment, expand the services, and this is going to cost money. Uh, uh, the ministry calculate is going to cost roughly 2.5 billion. However, they didn't receive that much. They got roughly 998 million, which is still a lot, considering that average capital spending of the ministry up 
until this year is roughly 70 million euros. So let's say that up until today, uh, the Ministry of Health was spending 70 million euros and, and suddenly they, they get a, a 1 billion to be spent in hospitals. So it's a massive increase. So still, it is a lot of money. So second part of, of reforms is focused on mental health, which is something that was not part of what was was not done by uh, the 26 projects of the previous government. Um, these mental health projects, uh, as a, they were, the, the reforms were prepared as a side project or side reform of, of value, value for money project, because as a, as a part of the reforms, the ministry realized that if they spend more money on mental health prevention, they could actually save money, not only in healthcare, but primarily in social care services, because people would be spending less time uh, on sick leaves, etc., etc., etc. So basically, what they want to do is they want to reorganize the mental health services. They want to create a, um, a new type of outpatient providers, uh, and of course, uh, they would like to spend plenty of resources training the personnel. So the, the overall budget is not as much; it's 105 million euros. But let's say that that mental health services are roughly seven percent of all spending in Slovakia. So it's not of healthcare spending. So not it's it's not a lot. And third type of reforms they would like to do is they would like to uh, finally um, uh, finish a long-term care reforms because in us in us system, um, unfortunately, we have a strict division between what is a healthcare sector and what is the social care sector, which causes a problem because once you uh, you have a long term injury or long term state a disability, uh, there is an overlap between these two services. But in practice, there was a big problem. It was very difficult to integrate the services, which caused a patient uh, having to see several different doctors and several different social care servants in order to get his reimbursement, in order to get his services. So this is the third type of, of uh, reform projects they would like to, like, like to do. Uh, of course, uh, we have a new Minister of Health currently. Uh, he has not yet uh, announce what his priorities will be. As I mentioned, um, I, I'm going to be an advisor of him and his secretary. Um, and uh, um, his his idea so far, but this reform project is that he wants to finish COVID. Um, let's say COVID trouble, and then he will he will he will see which out of the other 26 projects or these projects or new projects he will he will look into it. But nonetheless, nothing changes on the fact that the basis of all reforms that we do is the value for money project I mentioned, and also some other strategies such as oncological screening programs uh, that uh, that are valid in Slovakia. Right. So. Uh, as I mentioned, the details are not yet public available, but this was a very brief overview of, of, of Slovakia and our, uh, let's say, reform attempts and ideas that we have done so far. So I've gone through it at very, um, let's say, superficial way, but if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them or provide you with more detailed information if you, if you are interested. So thank you for listening. Mr. Smetana, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, can, I... can you hear me, actually? Yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very Miran. much for the presentation. Uh, very comprehensive. And please send the file in indeed. Yes. And, uh, now I would like to ask uh, Mr. Harazian to make some comments. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, but I, <clears throat> I listen that uh, Mr. Nazaretian wanted to say something. Maybe after his uh, questions, uh, no, no, uh, I will, uh, yeah, I will add. No, Mr. No, Nazaretian, you please, go ahead. No please. Problem. No, 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 no. no, no problem. Please, please. You go, you go ahead. You start. First. Please. So, can I now? Okay. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Smetana, for your very much detailed, not superficial at all, presentation of current situation with the healthcare system, mostly um, focused on the on the financial part of the problem or financial part of the reforms. Um, if I may just ask very few questions 
pretty, pretty much. Uh, first of all, I am the head of department of the healthcare uh, management at the National Institute of Health in Yerevan, Armenia. Mm -hmm. um, if you be kind, so kind to you, in few words, to explain us the typical pathway of a patient in Slovak Republic when patient got sick. What is the principal or main pathway of that patient to go through the primary healthcare system? I assume you have also the system of the gatekeepers all the way through that part, the chain to general hospital or specialized healthcare all the way through to long-term socialized care. What would be typical pathway of that kind of a person? Would you please? So, um, it is compulsory that if you want to, let's say, uh, you cannot see a specialist unless it is a psychiatrist or uh, 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 a guy who checks your eyes. <laughs> um, directly, you have to see the GP. It is a requirement. You need to get your referral for specialist or other care. So you have to. You have, it is compulsory for you to see your GP. Uh, you you can choose uh, a GP as um, whichever you want. You can change your GP twice a year. Uh, he is paid uh, per capita just for having you on his list plus services he provides to you, right? So GP then can refer you to a, uh, a specialist or to certain types of diagnostic services, not all of them, but most of them, right? So in most cases, he's not allowed to, to send you directly to a MRI scan uh, because it in most cases requires a specialist, but basically this is how the situation works. The problem is that Slovakia has uh, the second highest number of patient visits per year, uh, so uh, per person. So a person on average sees a doctor 11 times per year. Wow, uh, that's pretty high. Yeah, it's extremely high. And the problem is that considering that we have so many of GPs missing, because we have very disproportionate number of GPs and specialists. So in most cases, a GP sends, uh, GP doesn't work as a gatekeeper. A GP works as a, mm, let's say, uh, as a starting point. He, he, you come to see him and he sends you to specialist, even though if he had time, he could treat you, right? So in most cases, GPs send even unnecessary cases to specialist care, which is then overburden the system, makes it more expensive. But let's say the patient is finally sent to a specialist care. Most specialists have much wider range of diagnostic services they can further refer you to. So let's say that you are a, uh, a diabetic patient and you got a uh anti probianti test because it seems that you have a problem with your heart right so it, it cannot be done by gp it can be done only by your diabetologist right by himself uh so once you are the diabetologist he can he can refer you to the, the, the to the uh, diagnostic services then with the results you come back to the diabetologist and then he decides what's going to happen to you if you if you are uh, let's say a standard patient you can be treated uh, by the gps or you can stay in his office and if you require a hospitalization and it is elective care he refers you to a hospital but in slovakia you have free choice of hospitals all you need to do is find a hospital which has a capacity uh, they are waiting uh, slovakia has waiting lists however only for some groups of services uh, which is usually like cataract uh, some knee surgery etc so for most surgeries you don't have like a, a waiting list so you don't know how much you are going to wait so it is up to your luck and uh, and and if you know somebody to find a good the good right. schedule right uh, so we have general and specialized hospitals, however, they don't work, how to say, uh, considering that we don't have clear, or don't have at all a definition of the minimum and maximum services provided. Uh, some of the general hospitals actually provide everything that special hospitals do, and some of the special hospitals actually are not special at all, they just call themselves special, but we have, let's say, a national uh, oncological institute, a uh, or East uh, Oncology Institute. So we have some specific requirements, but it is up always up to the specialist to recommend you where you where you should go or where you should not go. So let's say that he recommends you to have your surgery uh, done at the, at the, let's say, University Hospital in Bratislava, so you will come there. And after you have your surgery, 
uh, you will leave the hospital with a prescription for the medicines uh, with the for three three days only, with uh, information that you need to see your GP for the rest of your prescription. So this is how the system works. And here's the problem where I say that we have a, a problem with uh, long-term care, social care, and healthcare, because let's say that you need a long-term treatment but you are basically discharged uh, after hospitals. If you need long-term treatment, you are discharged after hospital after a few weeks, and you have no time actually to get hold of all permits for your social home care, everything, which often leads to family having to take care after you up until you get hold of all permits. But this is a bit more complex, but this is basically how the system in Slovakia works. Thank you very much. Let me, let me just tell you very quick what I like in your in your presentation at most, I really very like that 26 project mapping. That's yeah, wonderful. Yes. I mean, it's so clear and so interlinked, interconnected. I like it very much. I probably will use the same approach in, in our practice, especially for training. But at the meantime, I have a, one of, in one of your last slides, there was a uh, statement like optimization of hospitals. Yes. The word of optimization in, in our country is kind of a so-called, let me, dirty word. Because <laughs> after optimizations, we have got a lot of problems and we do not really want to make more mistakes. When you stated optimization of hospitals, what is the main purpose? What you're gonna optimize? Structure, processes, or outcomes? Yes. Yes, good question. So uh, just one small point relating to 26 projects. I mean, uh, the, the, some of the projects didn't survive. Some of the projects, uh, you know, did because once the, the minister, because the minister who introduced the 26 projects, he was then later, let's say, promoted. He left the Minister of Health and he became Minister of Interior Affairs, right? Because we had some changes in the government. So he didn't finish them. And that's where the problem came in because the, the picture showed you how interesting them are. And let's say that some of the projects were driven by him. And once he left, the projects were abandoned. But which means the, the, idea whole is system. the idea is still there and it's really yeah. pretty much uh, good. Uh, a good one. Yeah, and the optimization, right. Uh, exactly as you said and that's the reason that the current current uh, uh, government the current minister called the project optimization hospitals we were really trying to avoid the word optimization because it really gets these questions we, that's why we call this stratification or we called it a healthy change or something no we had nice pr names but the the aim of the of the of the optimization is that uh, that that's what I was, I was trying to to outline is that we as of today, hospitals do not have rules of what they can and can't do and what are the conditions of the can and can't, right? And they want to, and if theoretically and uh, hypothetically we had an ideal world, we would have an optimal network of providers. So we would know that we would need, let's say 38 or 40 hospitals. We know that we would need, let's say 80 beds for neurosurgery, 250 beds for I don't know, it's too, too few, rehabilitation, et cetera. Et cetera. That's what, why this is called op optimization because they want to make an optimal network or they've set a ideal they want to achieve in terms of, of outpatient care. And uh, in order to achieve it, they need to change the, the network, they need to change the quality criteria, they need to change, uh, they need to invest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's why it's called, that's why it is using the word optim optimization in it. But yes, exactly, as you said, it, it, it infers, Plenty of negative uh, connotations, and I completely agree with it. It's not, it's a, it's not a good. Absolutely. Yeah. And you yeah. also mentioned the new definition of urgency care. I would be very keen to know what do you mean under that new definition of urgency care? Yes. What does it mean? Uh, right. So the Uh, the, the way how emergency services uh, are provided in Slovakia can be split into three groups. The first groups are the uh, outpatient, outpatient ambulances, which okay. are open up until, uh, mm -hmm. I think, midnight only. Then you have emergency department in hospitals, uh, which are of two levels, two tiers. And then you have uh, uh, emergency cars, ambulances, standard one, right? Mm -hmm. And um, even though this 
all adds up to a nice structure. Uh, each of the, let's say, segment was done by different department of the ministry, and each of them, how to say, the, 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 they didn't talk together a lot. And the, I see. the resulting state was that you had, let's say, uh, a, an outpatient provider in different city than inpatient provider. Uh, then you had uh, not optimized network of, of uh, the, the hospital cars, you know, so it didn't add up together well. So they looked into it from holistic perspective from the scratch and they said, okay, I need department here. I need the uh, optimal point here, 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 because I know that on average, a car which is working here has four visits of patients, et cetera, et cetera. So they did a nice analytical work and once again, create a hypothetical ideal they would like to achieve. I see. We have the MDs on board or paramedicals only? Yes. Or both? Yes. You have MDs on board on the vehicle? Uh, depends. We have four types of, of cars and uh, in the, in the first, let's say it's called the the highest tier, you have MD, and in the other ones, uh, you have the uh, paramedics. Okay, and last one, very, very much, it's pretty specific. What is the story with that uh, that Sputnik V in Slovakia? What kind of vaccine do you have for massive uh, vaccination? You do not have a, a, a Sputnik at all? Right, yes. So. Uh, so the situation in Sputnik is rather well strange because we we are uh, we are up until today we, we have been still using the vaccines which are approved by EMA so standard uh, Pfizer Astra oh yeah AstraZeneca yeah AstraZeneca yes 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 AstraZeneca and no, Johnson Johnson but it is still not that available to be to be used uh, we made a mistake in January and February when Pfizer announced that it increased its production and uh, member states can uh, order m m greater batches. So the more Pfizer's, uh, our Ministry of Health and the department which was responsible for that says that we don't need that because we, we had sufficient number of, of vaccines um, uh, purchased. However, a couple of weeks later, AstraZeneca announced that it's going to significantly decrease the number of vaccines they are going to deliver to Europe, which, which would cause us to have by the end of June, roughly 38% of people vaccinated, in comparison to the average of EU, roughly 40, 45 or 46%, right? So this was an issue. And as a part of it, uh, that's my opinion, uh, former prime minister wanted to solve this problem. And one solution he, he noticed from Hungary was to use Sputnik V, right? Mm. Uh, the problem was that he didn't let his part partners and other uh, coalition parties and other, other members or, or other groups of the expats who are aiding him that he's going to do it. And he procured uh, 2 million doses of, of, of vaccines without formal approval. And he had a press conference when uh, the vaccines were delivered, the first batch of 200,000. So this was the problem. So it was, it, it started as a, let's say, a, a uh, the, it was, how to say, he didn't communicate it transparently. He did it behind their backs. Okay. So they objected to it. And of course, uh, it is a custom and standard in Slovakia that if you want to use something, it has to have an approval by European Medical, medical Agency or Slovak State of Slovak Agency of, of medical uh, well approvals. But the problem is that uh, in Slovak Agency, Slovak Agency employs 210 employees. Emma employs roughly 900 plus thousand external employees. And Slovak agency has never ever approved a, a vaccine. So they have no idea how to do it. They have no experience how to do it. And they said, uh, we can't do it. It's going to take us ages and we won't be able to prove if it is efficient and how it is efficient. And this is how the situation, well, uh, developed. Yeah. I see. Mr. Smetana, thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. And uh, Mr. Karazian, it's over to you if you want to continue. Thanks again. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nazaretian. And thank you, Mr. Svetana, for this comprehensive uh, presentation. And uh, I have uh, <clears throat> a couple of questions regarding the uh, uh, health uh, 
financing system in uh, Slovakia. And uh, first of all, I want to ask uh, the governance of the uh, health insurance system. Can you please uh, a little bit uh, detailed uh, talk about the governance? So uh, how, uh, we, how, how organized the uh, health insurance system? Uh, who is uh, the, are, are there uh, any uh, participants from the government and uh, from the, uh, from the, the uh, private sectors, so this. Yes. Okay. So basically, as I mentioned, uh, as we have a, a Bismarck Systems social health insurance company, which means that every single employee has to pay a certain part of his wages to a fund, and then fund is then redistributed uh, among health insurance companies. Uh, you pay uh, well all together with your employee fourteen percent of your wage uh, to the fund. If you are disabled, you pay only seven. There are some exemptions, etc. Right? Um, we have a uh, uh, the, the 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 funds, the health insurance companies uh, can be public or private. Uh, when the reform was introduced in 2000 something, I think we had 14 health insurance companies. As of today, we have three. So the largest one, which is owned by state, uh, it has roughly 60% of market share. And then the two private ones, one is owned by local financial group and one is owned by um, Dutch Acmea, large health insurance group from Netherlands, right? Um, as I mentioned, we know that if you have free health insurance companies, there is a high likelihood that some of the insur insurers will be more risky and more expensive than others. And that's the reason why the, the all collected funds are redistributed using a risk allocation mechanism, which looks into uh, how likely is your age, gender, uh, plenty of variables uh, impact on your expenses to health insurance companies, and then they send money among each other to compensate for different uh, risk of the patients, right? So we have central fund, which redistributes resources uh, among three health insurance companies, and then uh, there are some redistribution mechanisms among them to make sure it is uh, uh, fair of as fair as, as, as possible. Uh, uh, an insurer can choose a health insurance company once a year, so you can choose, but you can't leave for another year. However, there is very limited difference in terms of product that they can offer because they health insurance companies don't offer any products because you have your premium, which is defined by legislation. Um, you have in Slovakia, there is very wide basket of services provided for free because uh, but dentists and certain plastic services, everything is basically for free. So only uh, only factor that uh, stops you from getting your care are waiting lists or unavailable to services, which means that the health insurance companies are fairly comparable to each other and they differ only in some small bits and, and, and pieces. Um, the, the ministry the, the, as, I, as I mentioned, that if you are employed, you pay amount to the, the fund. If you are not employed, which means if you are a student or re retired or disabled, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, it is the government that pays on your behalf the the, the, the premium. And this is the, the reason why the Minister of Finance still has an impact even over and on the, the private insurance companies, because this is the subject of negotiation. You know, the, the when I introduced, when I discussed the uh, no policy change, policy change, value for money and budget. So this is something through which a minister of finance can influence the budget because it can say, I'm going to pay for insurance of stay 5% or I'm going to pay 8% or I'm going to pay 1%, right? So uh, all these resources are then once again allocated into the, the common pool and reallocated among health insurance companies. So it's our, sim our system is very simple. Free insurance companies, allocation pools, risk adjustment among them, and Minister of Finance that can intervene if the resources are uh, outside of, or if, if they're lacking of resources. Uh, Ministry of Health can, um, control health insurance companies either through the budget or through the legislation which can say that you are obliged to contract 
this and that network of providers, or you are obliged to have a maximum waiting uh, times for the surgery of, let's say, abdominum of one month. So this is the way how the Ministry of Health can do it. However, it has not been doing it, um, let's say, to the extent it could. And in most cases, the Ministry of Health has been controlling uh, the sector through the largest health insurance company since it, it owns it, right? I was the member of the advisory board of the, of the insurance company. So this is in, in, I'm not sure if it answered all your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, is about uh, the payment system. You talk about uh, the primary health care payment that uh, they paid by per capita uh, system. Uh, and uh, what is about uh, the inpatient care? And you talking about the uh, DRG system. Yes. Uh, are you already introduced DRG or you are in the moving toward for it? Well, it's a good question. What does it mean? Uh, introduce DRG because we have introduced DRG a couple of years ago. However, it is not yet fine-tuned at all. And we know that there are significant problems with it. But yes, our hospitals have um, uh, paid based on DRG payments or DRG mechanism. However, since it is, um, uh, we are still, let's say, in third year of using it properly, uh, all hospitals have, let's say, uh, prospective budgets, which means that uh, health insurance companies calculate that uh, we expect you to spend next year 80 million euros. So we are going to give you a budget of 80 million euros. If you overspend it by more than 20%, we are going to give you more. If you underspend it, we are going to decrease it for you. Yet every single treatment they provide, they uh, they bill using the RG system. And the, the reason why they do it this way, that they are using the RG system and yet they have prospective budget, is that they want to stimulate hospitals to, to properly code the RG, so to not misuse it, but learn how to use it and to fine tune the data and the payments per different groups. So this is how it, how it is currently. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the next uh, question is uh, about the information system, uh, because uh, I know that we know that uh, without the info good information system, uh, we can't uh, achieve the results and uh, efficiency in yes. the financing and other parts. And so it will be very interesting how is structured and uh, uh, which kind of software you use is it uh, already uh, implemented uh, in the whole country yes. or yeah thank you right so well uh, we have as since 2000 i think 13 uh, we have legislation and we have an entity which is called national center for healthcare information which centralizes all data flows into under one roof uh, so the National Center is supposed to run electronical medical record for patients, and it is supposed to uh, centrally collect all information from all providers, from all health, health insurance companies. I am deliberately using the word supposed to because there has been several issues and problems and, and uh, well, 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 problems, that's, that's probably the word. Uh, which 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 uh, caused that uh, as of today we have only some um, segments of medical card working such as electronic prescription uh, some waiting times however most of the data is not yet fully integrated into into one system and health insurance companies are running their own softwares and own IT systems to cover for this this uh, uh, well this gap and issues. And nonetheless, um, when I when I described uh, the findings of the Value for Money project, it was done on the data from the National Center for Healthcare Information. So the most of the piece of information is already there. However, it is it is not yet fully integrated, fine tuned, uh, stable. So they have a, a rollout period of 2023 by which they would like to have everything digitalized under one under one roof. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, the uh, last question uh, is uh, about um, uh, 
uh, you're talking about the resources, uh, so the specialists, healthcare specialists, doctors and nurses, and uh, it is uh, interesting which kind of uh, system of uh, licensing uh, you use for uh, uh, medical staff and um, are, are they going to the accreditation or some type of licensing uh, the medical staff and uh, of course the medical institutions medical facilities also uh, do you have this lack of mechanism and uh, how you regulate uh, for example the mistakes and something some this lack of things uh, with the uh, staff uh, and and related with the uh, quality of the medical care so yes. how it is organized yes, good. good question so yes uh, if you if you want to have your outpatient surgery ambulance whatever you need to get an approval by self governing region which has a list of a checkup list that you need to what all you need to fulfill in order to receive a license as a part of the license you also receive your opening hours and some other conditions which you are obliged to update every every time there is a change right if you are a hospital uh, you are getting licensed by for example a ministry so there are different tiers and different groups of people who decide as a person yes if you want to have if you want to run your own uh, uh, surgery or ambulance you need to have your accreditation and accreditation is done by um, and it depends on what profession you are and at a Slovak chamber of doctors or nurses etc etc so this is how it how it how it works however our chambers don't do um, in comparison to for example Germany or Austria where they actually are really trying to work with doctors and nurses they are trying to measure let's say the quality or something they don't do anything like this so they just they just have a list of if you have a if you are a doctor approved, if you are not an approved doctor, and all then you need to do is to get your approval by the self-governing region or by the ministry, and you will just receive your code, which is your ID, and that's all you need to all you need for, for, for all you need in order to work. When it comes to some quality assurances and issues, uh, for that reason we have that healthcare surveillance authority, which is supposed to um, supposed to attend any. Uh, issues, any concerns by patients, uh, any misuse. So it is that authority which is supposed to do the job, right? And in most cases, this is something that they are doing well. So yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.